Fresh meat. Technology-based horror has always stood out to me as a great marker of time. It's something that comments on the one thing that changes and grows at a speed to which we are never truly in control or comfortable with. Yet, it's a great time capsule to explore, a snapshot that always encapsulates the culture. We have Clint Howard becoming possessed through his PC in evil speak, yeah, because at that point computers were basically magic to the general audience. James Bond himself helping his slow neighbor become a god in VR with the lawnmower man, which is a lot better for time than people give it credit for. In 2020, we had a Zoom seance with the host somehow showing the one thing that should have been primed for a f***ing pandemic and dropped the ball completely. Skype. But for today's entry of The Black Sheep, we are heading back to the early 90s, an era I love and I'm sure that you already know. The height of fear with video game violence and the great little horror flick born out of it. Today, my friends, I am showing some love for 1994's Brain Scan. I want to thank you guys for watching The Black Sheep and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now back to the show. You see, I'm old enough to remember the 90s video game scare and how, uh, like metal in the 80s, parents lost their minds and then Congress got involved. The NES brought gaming into the mainstream, yet it was Sega along with those pesky and angsty youths of the 90s that were a part of the games that caused the congressional hearing. Once again, we got sex and violence mixed in the message. This has to stop. You need to shut the fuck up. You see, Brain Scan tells the story of Michael, a 90s whore-obsessed teen whose nearly absent father and dead mother caused him to seek refuge in movies and games. The cool ones, by the way. He orders a copy of the immersive horror CD-ROM that promises a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Except the game, which seems to be real, ends up being just that. And now Michael is responsible for an actual murder. And the only one that can help is the video game mascot or default assistant. Uh, I, I, I don't know. My name is Trickster. Kind of a mix between Freddy Krueger and Clippy from Microsoft. Combined with a metalhead, with one sweet mullet, and a penchant for murder and primus. Now, brain scan must be set in some sort of alternate universe where tech has only advanced in two areas, gaming and voice-activated telecommunications. Essentially, Alexa, only strictly for phone calls. But here's the thing, just accept this sci-fi portion as it lends itself to the very 90s world. You see, Michael's an angry teen who witnessed his mother's death in a car crash that he survived. And his dad that constantly travels for work makes for kind of an awkward home environment. So he doesn't have a guidance or love to sort of help steer him through his awkward teen years. And though these emotional teen issues and the hint of PTSD weren't explored with much thought, I mean, let's be honest, the 90s were a bit brash and uh, didn't quite have the nuance that we have today, but we're given enough info to know he's found solace in horror, and let's be honest, who here can't relate to that? Well, I can tell you who is principal, who ends up being that sort of family values type of dick. And though unintentional, he gives probably one of the most dumb, drug PSA, uh, smoke two joints attitude about the subject matter. Like lighting up a marijuana cigarette and escaping the real world, hmm? Reefers. Now, I want to give this movie some credit for giving Michael an emotional arc with parental issues driving his character. Things dig a bit deeper, which is much appreciated. Now, I must say, a chunk of screen time is spent in what may be the coolest room for an adolescent like me at the time. That pitch attic style roof with cool posters, you know, his unique phone setup, Bangoria magazines, and a hot girl across the street who does a strip tease in front of her open window knowing she's being watched. Hey, she likes it. Rock out. You need some help? I filmed in 1993, CGI wasn't a top contender, and besides Jurassic Park, 
which we always bring up, this was wise to keep things as grounded as possible. Taking a hint from Sega CD, which was, at the time, trying to change the gaming landscape with a real look by adding movie-esque graphics via CD-ROM. BrainScan uses an animation-conscious transfer. You know, like I said, dated, of course, but hey, it kind of has that lawnmower man charm, so I'll let it pass. But this uses a simple first-person perspective for the in-game world. Like Sega CD was trying to make big at the time, and things like Myst tried to do previously. I should say Trickster wisely helps you out. Instead of spending the entire time riding your ass like Ghost did in Sewer Shark, the guy you're replacing, he had that same tough guy spark on his face that you do. Oh, referencing a game probably 2% of played, going big. Which brings me actually to the best part of all, T. Ryder Smith as Trickster. Don't you have anything good? After the first kill and reveal of the missing foot in the freezer, the trickster appears and becomes instantly iconic. A well-dressed mutant metalhead with one fantastic mullet. Again, Trickster, the voice of encouragement in the game, manifests himself to keep Michael playing. Because the only way to survive and stay out of the cop's sights is to finish what he started. Supposedly, the original draft of the script had T. Ryder Smith hired solely for the voice, and that the visual representation of Trickster and the cool character that came from it was birthed based on a rewrite. And a wise choice on that, as Smith exudes so much personality and unnerving charm that he makes Trickster the most memorable part of the movie. And that's not knocking the movie. You see, it's a very specific character that really lives in the early 90s MTV era of life. Special effects artist Steve Johnson, one of the best in the biz, if you ask me, played his cards right by making Trickster human enough that he isn't immediately creepy, but adds little touches of uncanny valley that makes the character so off. Like a wide nose, intense brow bone, and that stretched out mouth. Of course, accompanied with the obvious monstrosities, like his Nosferat two fingers, and those little monster teeth. Smith plays him as more of an evil ally, someone with a sense of humor that wants to help, but would obviously eat your soul given the chance. And the film does something that I'm surprised they did. They use him sparingly, and you always want more. I think of the trickster as kind of the child of uh, Iggy Pop and Keith Richards. I've always liked Edward Furlong and think his 90s run was pretty damn solid and embodied that 90s kid to perfection. Great hair part and raspy and angst-ridden voice. I mean, come on, let's run down the list here. Terminator 2, Pet Cemetery 2, which I've defended and I know a lot of you don't like, but you're wrong. Brain Scan, we're here right now. American History X, Detroit Rock City, and the only real sequel to Terminator 2, which is Battle Across Time. If you know, you know. And with Michael, he plays a character with the right amount of depressive piss and vinegar while being downright scared. He does well with the role, and though director John Flynn would say otherwise, hey, the kid gets the job done. Frank Langella plays Detective Hayden with a stoic ease. As somewhat of his stature would, that's not much of a part and one that you'd usually find more of a character actor for, because let's be honest, script-wise, it's, it's kind of cut dry. Yet the legendary actor and sly leg toucher adds depth overall commanding the screen and making the detective a real threat to Michael. Overall, this is just a really good time, and we get some cool scenes like the first kill in first-person perspective, cutting off the foot, or when he goes to clean up some incriminating evidence and has to avoid a town search, or the melding scene where Michael goes to kill Kimberly, played by future star Amy Hargraves, and becomes one with Trickster. Though a fun scene as it is, the original cut went full the thing and had this great body horror effect. And though I think it would have been a great surprise and a cool added layer at the end, I will admit it, it doesn't quite fit with what came before. That being said, I am pro body horror, so I would have preferred this whether it worked or not. Now it isn't perfect. Some of the dialogue is awkward at times and Michael gets away out of plot convenience in a scene or two. And let's not forget Kyle looks 30 and sounds like he's making fun of a surfer dude out of Point Break. Now, I, I, this is probably uh, not supposed to be funny to me, but I really do love at the very end 
Michael finally owns up and asks Kimberly out. And she's like, yeah, nah. I mean, I'll think about it. It's not really a good time to ask, you know what I mean? Uh, clearly, she's more into being watched. And again, no kink shaming. But Michael takes this as wisely as Lloyd does. You'll think about it. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yes. I mean, how can we at least come together in this great soundtrack? White Zombie, Butthole Surfers, Mud Honey, Primus. I mean, fuck, this is so 90s, I love it. Hopefully, we can all come together and give this its due. The always great Scream Factory gave it a nice Blu-ray release, making it prime for a rewatch. I am glad that such a cool and unique character like Trickster lives in a singular world. Brain scans are one and done, that's it. And I'll be honest, <laughs> I've had enough things overexposed and milked to death. So if you haven't seen this, or you need to revisit, pop in the old CD-ROM and relive a simpler time. I am beautiful, no matter